Section eight of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McIlwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University in estimating the importance of magna carta what we chiefly need is a history of the document in the period after twelve fifteen one of the most significant points in that subsequent development is the famous confirmation by edward i in twelve ninety seven this confirmation is in part as follows Quote, know ye that we to the honour of god and of the holy church and to the profit of all our realm et à profit de tout notre royaume have granted for us and our heirs that the great charter of liberties le grand chartre des franchises and the charter of the forest which were made by common assent of all the realm lesquelles furent faites par commun assent de tout le royaume in the time of king henry our father shall be kept in every point without breach soit tenu en tous leurs points son nul blemisement and we will that these same charters shall be sent under our seal to our justices both to those of the forest and to the rest and to all sheriffs of shires and to all our other officers and to all our cities throughout the realm together with our writs in the which it shall be contained that they cause the aforesaid charters to be published and have it declared to the people that we have granted that they shall be observed in all points and that our justices sheriffs mayors and other officials who under us and by us have to administer the law of the land qui la loi de la terre de sous nous et par nous ont à guier shall allow the said charters in pleas before them and judgments in all their points that is to say the great charter of liberties as common law and the charter of the forest according to the assize of the forest for the relief of our people c'est à savoir la grande chartre des franchises comme loi commune et la chartre de la forêt selon l'assise de la forêt à l'amendement de notre peuple two and we will that if any judgments be given from henceforth contrary to the points of the charters aforesaid by justices or by any other our ministers that hold pleas before them touching the points of the charters they shall be undone and holden for naught et voulant que s'il nul jugement soit donné désormais en contre les points des chartres avant dites par justice et par nos autres ministres qui contre les points des chartres tiennent plaie devant eux soit défait et pour néant tenu three and we will that the same charters shall be sent under our seal to cathedral churches throughout our realm and there remain and shall be read before the people twice in the year four and that archbishops and bishops shall pronounce sentences of greater excommunication against all those that by word deed or counsel shall go against the aforesaid charters or that in any point break or go against them and that the said curses be twice a year denounced and published by the prelates aforesaid and if the same prelates or any of them be remiss in the denunciation of the said sentences the archbishops of canterbury and york for the time being as is fitting shall reprove them and constrain them to make that denunciation in form aforesaid End quote under the first of these sections the king's justices are directed to administer magna carta as common law com loi commune the sense hereof says coke is that the great charter and the charter of the forest are to be holden for the common law that is the law common to all and that both the charters are in amendment of the realm that is to amend great mischiefs and inconveniences which oppressed the whole realm before the making of them End quote. this paper is an attempt to explain still further the sense hereof 
but the most difficult part of the explanation as usual lies in that part of the provision whose meaning seems at first the most obvious loi commune no tolerably prepared candidate in an english or american law school will hesitate to define an estate in fee simple says sir frederick pollock Quote, on the other hand the greater have been a lawyer's opportunities of knowledge and the more time he has given to the study of legal principles the greater will be his hesitation in face of the apparently simple question what is law End quote. one's opportunities of knowledge would have to be great indeed to be even in slight degree commensurate with his hesitation in attempting to define common law with all that it implied in twelve ninety seven but defined it must be in some fashion before we can understand the real significance of magna carta in the later middle ages some examination of contemporary records has convinced me that coke's interpretation is in the main the correct one but one of his statements seems also to show that it is correct in a sense possibly somewhat different from the one he had in mind this is his inclusion without comment of the charter of the forest with magna carta as the common law what then is the law common to all what made it common in twelve ninety seven how did this conception of a common law and the mass of corresponding rights actually come into existence and finally what light is thrown by an explanation of these things upon the history and character of magna carta itself for a considerable part of the period when the common law was taking form in england there may be observed in the writers on law a certain struggle between the roman idea of lex and the mediaeval conception of law as immemorial usage the judges of those times who were generally in orders were better acquainted with roman legal conceptions than many of their brethren of a much later time their knowledge and reverence for these ideas coupled with the necessity they were under of administering a law of a different origin at a less advanced stage of development but with roots so deep in the traditions and habits of the people that its binding force was unquestionable these are the chief explanation of apparently incompatible statements concerning the basis and extent of the royal authority which even the adiciones in a text like bracton's cannot wholly explain in the field of private law somewhat the same struggle is to be seen between lex and consuetudo the one a product of the classical period of roman law the other a growth of the middle ages out of roots that are quite different the mediaeval desire for unity led the jurists of the time to make interesting attempts to reconcile these conflicting conceptions constantine's famous dictum consuetudinis ususque longaiwi non wilis auctoritas est they gladly fasten upon but it will not fully serve their needs until it is practically inverted so the author of glanville feels it necessary to apologize to his learned readers for an english customary law which he never thinks of questioning footnote the customary law consuetudo he also calls jura regni but he will not admit a sharp distinction between it and lex though it is mainly unwritten for he is not ignorant of the popular origin of lex even in rome leges namque anglicanas licet non scriptas leges appellari non videtur absurdum cum hoc ipsum lex sit quod principi placet leges habet vigorem eas scilicet qua super dubiis in concilio definiendis procerum quidem concilio et principis accidente autoritate constat esse promulgatas tractatus de legibus et consuetudinibus regni angliae prologus confer justinian institutes one two three with which glanville in common with nearly all the mediaeval english juristic writers prefaces his treatise End footnote. 
Glanville is quoted word for word by the author of Flata, but without acknowledgment. Bracton also begins his treatise with the usual liberal quotations from the Institutes, and borrows from Glanville the sentence identifying Consuetudo with Lex, but his treatment of the subject is fuller and much more valuable. It is clear that these medieval writers are faced with a Consuetudo, a Lex known scripta, which is binding much as Lex was binding in the later Roman Empire. In order, then, to apply their favourite texts in support of the existing law, they are under the necessity of including within Lex what was certainly not included in Justinian's time. The outstanding fact is that custom had really become law. It was accepted by common usage, pro lege. This is almost the central fact in early English law, but we moderns, like the Romans of the later empire, are so prone to identify lex and law that we can hardly appreciate the difficulty in which Glanville and Bracton found themselves. Glanville's apology for consuetudo was directed at the classicists and is easily understood by ourselves. To a twelfth-century Englishman, if unlearned in Roman law, it probably had very little meaning. But consuetudo was a thing well understood. Evidence of its importance and its binding character is abundant. Glanville himself, in the passage quoted above, though he is paraphrasing the institutes, cannot say, as they do, that in England the law is what the people or what any one constitue a Instead, he has to say that it consists of those things quas super dubiis in concilio definiendis, procerum quidem concilio, et principio accedente autoritate, constat esse promulgatas. It is something already in existence which may indeed need defining, but can only be promulgated, not made. The celebrated excommunication of 1253 mentions only those who violate the liberties of the church, Magna Carta, the charter of the forest, well antiquas regni consuetudines approbatas. It is not difficult to prove that these ancient customs of the realm were of binding force, even of supreme binding force. So the author of the Mirror of Justices, who may certainly be trusted as an interpreter of contemporary words and phrases, though we can no longer believe all his stories, declares that the article in the Statute of Marlborough concerning Reader Caesars is reprehensible because no special ordinance ought to exceed common law. Car nul mandement spécial ne doit passer comme un droit. And we find the justices of both benches required to take oath that in case they receive letters from the king commanding anything contrary to the law, they will enforce the law notwithstanding such letters. The Parliament Roll of the year 1330 contains an interesting petition by several nobles setting forth that they were entitled to lands escheated at the time of the suppression of the Templars, which lands, however, had been handed over by a statute irregularly procured by the dispensers to the hospitallers. They pray that this statute be annulled and quote the opinions of the judges against it. Les dites justice disaient appartement et expressement que le roi ni ne devote ni ne le peut faire par loi, non pas pour ce les dits hue et hue, pas pour qu'il avait fir faire un statut, si qu'on peut par le statut, que les hospitaliers eussent les terres de Templier, et en lequel les statut peut être trouvé que les justices ne s'assentirent point, car ils ne peuvent pour leur serment par la déshéritance du roi et de ses gens, et disaient que ce sont contraries à loi, Is que se les statues se fit contre loi et contre raison. 
in 1341, during the struggle between Edward III and his Parliament, the King had been compelled to make certain important concessions in return for the parliamentary grants. But when these had to be put in the form of a statute, the Chancellor, Treasurer and some of the Justices protested that they would not enforce them, En cas que même les statuts fussent contraires à les lois et usages du royaume, les que il fût sérimenté de garder. The reasons they assign are significant whether they were sincere or not. For the year 1347, there is a petition on the Parliament roll against a judgment made in Parliament, which is declared to be contre les lois du royaume et les usages approuvés. In 1397, Parliament annulled the award of Parliament convicting Hugh de Spencer, and seemingly endorsed the charge that the act of Edward III affirming this award fut fait contre droit, loi et raison. Quel est statut quant à les dix articles, ne ma droiturelle ne raisonnable, ne dut être de force par la loi était en contre droit et raison et en contre la loi de la terre. Two years later, on the accession of Henry the Fourth, the new king declared qu'il n'est pas son entente ne volonté pour tourner les lois et statuts ne bons usages, mais pour garder les anciennes lois et statuts ordaigné et usé en temps de ses nobles progéniteurs selon son serment. The pronunciatio, by which the Parliament of the first regnal year of Henry the Sixth was opened, declares the purpose of the session to be the enjoyment by all classes of their liberties and franchises which have not been repealed, ne par la commune loi repellable and the statutes of the next year open with a confirmation of all such franchises bien usé et ni en rappelé ne parla comme une loi rappelable some of these examples undoubtedly arise out of factional and even revolutionary struggles but the frequent and repeated insistence upon the supremacy of the common law as a justification even though it may be at times an unjust action that is justified seems to show conclusively the position occupied by the common law. It was, in a very real sense, a fundamental law. But if this law was really supreme, it becomes the more necessary to try to discover the points in which it differed from other rules or enactments, to ascertain as nearly as we can just what was common law. From the passage quoted above from Bracton, it appears that custom has the force of law in England, approbata more utentium, and that these consuetudines are either plures et diversi, i.e. particular customs, or common custom, which is consuetudo regni angliae. Thus he speaks of the king's retaining an outlaw's lands for a year and a day, Sicut esse debet secundum consuetudinem regni nostri Angliae, or of waste, contra consuetudinem regni nostri, or of an inquest, secundum consuetudinem regni Angliae. So he declares, et sicut papa ordinare potest in spiritualibus quod ordines et dignitates, Ita potest rex in temporalibus de hereditatibus dandis, well hereditibus constituendis, secundum consuetudinem regni sui. Habet enim quod libet regnum suas consuetudines et diversas, poterit enim una esse consuetudo in regno Angliae, et alia in regno Franciae quantum ad successiones. In Bracton's day, the organisation and powers of Parliament were still undeveloped, and the terminology of legislation was not yet fixed. His favourite term for enactments is constitutio, in which he shows his Roman and canon law training. He refers to the statute of Merton as noa constitutio, and to a violation of it as fraus constitutioni. 
he says also that a writ of novel de season will not issue where a tenant has granted so much of his estate in frank almoin that his lord had lost his service quia hoc est contra constitutionem in another place he asserts the same rule propte constitutionem libertatis these constitutiones are in addition to consuetudines which are in use throughout the realm hence many things are controlled by the law and custom of the realm it is no accident that the writs appointing the justices for an assize of novel de season command them to do justice secundum legem et consuetudinem regni nostri angliae judges are so to conduct themselves says bracton ut constitutione sedeorum edicta iuri et consuetudinibus approbatis et communi utilitati sint convenientia these are the rules to which Bracton refers as lex terrae et regni consuetudines and jus commune. Whether customary or statutory, it is the law common to the realm as distinguished from particular law. So in discussing waste, Bracton says, et quid debeat adjudicare ad vastum, et quid non propter magnitudinem et parvitem, habet quae libet patria suum modum constitutionem et consuetudinem and modus he says following the familiar doctrine of the roman lawyers though in a sense probably never meant by them and here speaking of grants legem dat donationi et modus tenendus est contra ius commune et contra legem quia modus et conventio vincunt legem of the law of succession he says item potterit conditio impedire descensum ad proprios heredes contra ius commune and because it is given to all in common it is called common law says the author of the mirror of justices of the law with which he deals references to the common law became more frequent as the thirteenth century closed for example it is said to be en contre la commune loi for a subject to inflict the death penalty on a criminal later in the reign of richard the second the commons complain of royal interference with la loi de la terre et comme un droit it is not necessary to multiply instances further though they are many the general connotation of common law is beyond doubt its exact meaning becomes clearer however when we take note of the special law that contemporaries were wont to contrast with it at times we find la commune loi thus designated to distinguish it from enactment footnote thus a litigant was told in one edward the second you are not aided by the common law nor by special law par la commune loi ni par loi especiale in the next year another was informed that he must rely either on common law or on special law par la commune loi ou par loi especiale variant par ancienne loi ou par nouvelle loi and that neither the common law nor la nouvelle loi will help him in thirteen seventy seven the commons petitioned for the observance and confirmation of la commune loi et auxin les especiales lois a statue a ordinance de la terre made for the common profit and good governance of the realm in the times preceding End footnote. or it might be the law of the church that was contrasted with it the lex forestae les lois d'armes the laws of the court of the constable and marshal the law of the staple roman law or the lex parliamenti but the special law found most often in contrast with loi commune is the consuetudo less frequently the lex of some particular region or district which differs in its provisions from the lex et consuetudo regni in the second regnal year of edward the second it was argued that a manor which formed a part of the king's ancient demesne was tel lieu que n'est pas à la commune loi 
in a case in 1307, certain tenements were declared to be divisible selon la coutume de Everwick, York. Cases of the law of Kent are numerous. For example, it was said in the Common Pleas in the 20th regnal year of Edward I that certain tenements are not transferred from the common law to a special law, changé hors de la commune loi en la especial loi, unless the partibility of the tenement could be proved. Here the special law is a customary one, le usage du pays. Wales and the Marches naturally give us many examples in the Middle Ages, particularly before the enactment of Statutum Walii. For tenements in Wales and the Marches, Article 56 of the Great Charter of John guarantees to Welshmen and Marchers trial by peers, secundum legem Walii and secundum legem Marchii, respectively. In the 25th regnal year of Henry III, a Welsh litigant pleads quod nescit placitare secundum consuetudinem Angliae, and obtains a continuance ad deliberandum. In 1281, Edward promised Llewellyn that the laws of Wales and the Marches should not be disturbed, and informed him that the judges had been so instructed. The Statutum Walii itself while asserting Edward's right to declare, interpret, increase and take away from these particular laws, especially in pleas of the Crown, expressly accepts the law of succession to lands, contracts, procedure, etc., which are to remain as they were, quia aliter usitatum est in walia quam in Anglia, et a tempore cuius non extitit memoria. In a case arising upon a decision in the nineteenth regnal year of Edward I, the defendant answers, Quod tenementa non sunt in comitatu, Hereford, sed sunt in marcia valiae, et debent in judicium de duci secundum legem marciae, et non per legem angliae, juxta statutum de runnymede et quod non sunt in comitatu et ideo, non deberent tractari per legem communem. The point was conceded. Two years later, Richard Fitzalan declares he is a baron of Wales, ubi est consuetudo approbata, that the barons should submit their disputes to the arbitration of a friend of both parties. In 1321, a number of persons in Wales petitioned the Chancellor to issue a writ to the Justice of North Wales to do justice secundum legem et consuetudinem parcium milarum. The law of the Scottish March, of course, was on the same general basis. In 1249, a commission consisting of twelve English and twelve Scottish knights were sworn to the observance of the leges marciarum. It seems clear, then, that common law is the lex et consuetudo regni angliae, usitae et approbatae communi utilitati convenientes, and that the basis of consuetudo, as of lex, is that it is approved, if not by express enactment, more utentium. This law is common because it is jus regni angliae, enforced and observed de consensu magnatum et re publicae communi sponsione. Special custom is such as in like manner observatur in partibus, and it might be added by certain classes or estates of the people, ubi fuerit more utentium approbata et vicem legis obtinet and special leges are those expressly assented to by the particular persons so bound by them. So we return to Coke's dictum that the common law is the law common to all. If our difficulties ended here, it would seem rather unnecessary to labour a point so apparently obvious at such length as I have done. But Magna Carta was not only common law, it was also enactment, and constantly referred to as such. In order to understand its real significance, we must first examine the larger question of the relation of enactment in general to the loi commune, 
and to make this difficult question as clear as possible it seemed necessary as a preliminary to restate much that is obvious in connection with the common law itself the next problem that meets us then is the relation of enactment to the law particularly the common law in medieval england and this is a problem of great difficulty as indicated above the names of enactments of law for the realm were variable until they became stereotyped by the general acceptance of parliament's enacting power the author of the leges henry key speaking probably of henry the first's famous writ for the holding of the shire and hundred courts says the practice founded in ancient custom had lately been confirmed by a record vera nuper est recordacione firmatum the constitutions of clarendon are spoken of in the preamble to the document as ista recordatio vel recognitio cuius dam partis consuetudinum et libertatum et dignitatum of the king's predecessors similarly the assize of clarendon is termed haec assisa as is also the assize of the forest in eleven eighty four john's charter of liberties itself is called this present charter of ours bracton speaks as we have seen of the statute of merton as nowa constitutio and elsewhere refers to a change in the law of dower made by it as brought about nowa superveniente gratia et provisione in a case in the forty-third regnal year of henry the third one of its sections was referred to as provisio de merton the edictum de kenilworth is well known and it was so called by contemporaries the statute of winchester is cited by the author of the mirror of justices as la constitution de Winchester. in the reign of henry the third the word statute begins to be prominent but at first hardly in any technical sense and alternative with other terms for example in the thirty-ninth regnal year of henry the third the statement is made that a rule in concilio apud merton provisum fuit et statutum concerning the procedure on a writ of right post illam constitutionem so in the fifty-second regnal year of henry the third mention is made of the pardon for transgressors in the time of the recent war ocasione provisionum seus statutorum exonii non observatorum by the time of edward i however it is evident that statute is becoming a technical term and the other names cease to be applied to the same enactments so the author of the mirror in the third chapter of his first book des premiers constitutions tells us that alfred ordained pour usage perpetuel that his nobles should assemble at least twice a year pour parlementer sur le guimont du peuple dieu par celle les statues he says divers ordinances were made in times subsequent the statutum de marleberg is referred to in pleas of the fifth and sixth years of the reign in michaelmas term the thirteenth and fourteenth regnal years of edward i judgment was given under a rule quod constitutum fuit per regem per secunda statuta west monasteriensia it is unnecessary to continue further a list which grows rapidly longer after this date statute has now become the usual word for a certain kind of enactments of parliament and it is sometimes applied to acts such as the one known as de asportatis religiosorum which are known to us only in forms not usual in statutes some of them being found only in the form of writs the uncertainty of some of these so-called statutes may be due to a looseness in the application of the term which disappeared later when the word invariably conveyed one definite and technical meaning statutum seems to be a popular rather than a technical term before the reign of edward i and it is possible that the non-technical employment of it may have survived longer in isolated cases 
to the confusion of the modern historian. End of section eight.